Welcome to the MRI safety video for Level 2 personnel, recently updated in May 2024. My name is Jeremy Corwin, and I am a medical physicist with Corwin Health Physics. We are a provider of medical physics services throughout the Northwest and also provide MRI safety consultation to many of our clients. The primary updates within this video from the previous version in 2021 are due to the recent updates in the ACR's manual on contrast media in 2023. This educational event will primarily be using the most recent version of the ACR manual on MRI safety from 2020. Additionally, we will include information from the ACR guidance document on MRI safe practices from 2019. A common emphasis in both of these documents is that all MRI facilities should maintain and critically review MRI safety policies. The ACR has published a list of recommended topics to be covered with regards to MRI safety and that list can be found on the ACR MRI accreditation website. I strongly recommend that every MRI technologist read through the ACR manual on MRI safety at least annually. This presentation will cover a significant portion of this ACR manual, but not all of it. Please consider reviewing this document. Remember, the MRI system may be the most dangerous piece of equipment in your facility. An important note was included in the 2019 update. The guiding principles of MRI safety remain. MRI personnel must be appropriately educated, be vigilant in their awareness of a dynamic environment, and apply that knowledge to screening before and fulfilling patient and staff member safety during their time in the MRI suite. Before we get too far into this, I should point out that there are two different levels of MRI personnel. Level 1 personnel are those that basically know the hazards associated with MRI and can ensure their own safety within Zone 3, but they do not have access to Zone 4. Level 2 MRI personnel are those that are more extensively trained on MRI safety. They can access Zone 4 and can escort others within Zone 4. They are able to screen and scan patients. Level 2 personnel are typically MRI technologists and MRI radiologists. This educational presentation is primarily for level two personnel. At the RSNA in 2020, Dr. Canal presented an excellent summary of the potential concerns for MRI. Scanning a patient in the MRI is not a simple task. There are so many things to consider. We have to worry about the static magnetic fields, the radio frequency fields, and gradient magnetic fields. But we also need to consider the non-magnetic field effects ranging from claustrophobia and contrast agent concerns to sedation and monitoring issues. I hope to review all of these during this presentation. We typically like to organize the MRI safety concerns into three main categories, each associated with different elements of the MRI system and its acquisition of patient images. The static magnetic field is a main concern due to items being pulled into the magnet due to the extreme force of the magnetic field. The radio frequency field, or RF field, is associated with heating and disruption of medical devices, and the pulsed gradient magnetic field can cause peripheral nerve stimulation, hearing loss, and potential interference with patient monitoring equipment. We will address each of these and more throughout this presentation. Since most of you are MRI technologists, you are all quite aware that the MRI system is a very large magnet. We need to continually emphasize to others that this magnet is always on. The magnetic field from the MRI system is unique from other imaging equipment's hazards. For instance, we typically understand that a computed tomography system, or CT system, which operates with ionizing radiation, will only provide radiation within the room itself, with very little going outside the room. With MRI, however, the magnetic field will often exceed the boundaries of the room. In the diagram here, we see that the magnetic field from this 3T magnet exceeds the boundaries of the room. Magnetic fringe field lines, which indicate the location and intensity of the magnetic field, are shown with concentric lines outside the MRI room. The magnetic field is continuously present. 
Since we have a strong magnetic field present, we restrict access to areas in MRI facilities by creating zones. The four zones are listed here, and we will go into detail with each of these zones. As noted on the previous slide, Zone 1 is the area for the general public. Zone 2 is typically the area in which the general public is interviewed and screened before entering Zone 3. Zone 2 is also populated by staff that may not be trained in MRI safety. Zones 3 and 4 are for individuals that have been trained or are escorted by someone that has been provided adequate training. Zone 3 is an area that is typically located directly outside the scanner room. We usually indicate that serious problems can occur in this area if the wrong equipment or an unscreened patient is present. This area should be restricted and employees entering Zone 3 need to have MRI safety training. Many MRI sites are old and they were configured before many of these safety regulations were created. So compliance with Zone 3 is very difficult. We would typically like to have Zone 3 separated and access controlled by badge or code, but this is sometimes not possible. For these sites that struggle with engineering controls for Zone 3, we recommend that you make your best effort to evaluate and comply with Zone 3 requirements. Ensure that all the individuals are trained within Zone 3. Maintain vigilant security of the scanner room. Also consider some modified engineering controls, such as ferromagnetic monitors or plastic fences, to prevent individuals accessing Zone 4. Zone 4 is the most hazardous area in MRI. It is the scanner room itself. If Zone 4 is directly accessible from Zone 3, try to keep the MRI door monitored at all times. Close the door whenever you enter. Try to position the patient from the far side of the scanner so that you can view the room. Ensure that only screened individuals access this area, including staff. Now regarding the magnetic field, current research indicates that there are no permanent biological effects from the field itself. So the field does not cause any harm to the person. But we are primarily concerned with the magnetic field attracting metallic objects or interfering with equipment. Some people have indicated some effect from the magnetic field, such as flashing of light, feelings of vertigo, or metallic tastes in their mouth. As you are aware, the main concern with the magnetic field is the pulling of objects into the magnet. Here is an example of the wrong bed being brought into the MRI suite. Please be aware of many common ferromagnetic items in the hospital. All of these items and more need to be prevented from entering the MRI suite. As many of you are aware, there are serious consequences of these ferromagnetic objects entering the room. These objects cause significant injuries to patients or staff, and they damage the MRI system significantly. So because of this extreme magnetic field, we have a policy that no unsafe items enter into the MRI room. There are three separate classifications of items for entry into the MRI room. An item that has an MRI safe symbol on it will indicate that the item is considered safe when brought into the MRI suite under any conditions. An item that is unsafe is one in which we know it poses hazards in all MRI environments and must not be brought into the MRI suite. An MR conditional label device is one that has been demonstrated to pose no known hazards under specific conditions. The documentation with these devices must be reviewed and evaluated to ensure the MR conditional device can be brought into the MRI room. For instance, some items may be labeled conditional and specified that they have been evaluated and found safe in a 1.5T magnet room. This would mean that the item has not been found safe to be within an MRI room that is a 3T system. So every facility has a policy that no unsafe items are taken into the scanner room. If you don't know if an item is safe, do not guess. Make sure someone evaluates the item. Here's an example of an item that is conditional. This anesthesia machine may enter the MRI suite, but only under certain conditions. You will need to review the documentation associated with any equipment to ensure you meet those conditions before you let them into the MRI room. 
Oxygen canisters are an issue at most medical facilities. Ensure that only MRI safe oxygen canisters are brought into the MRI suite. Crash carts are never to be brought into the MRI room. Your procedures for a code should be very specific and practiced, and these crash carts need to remain outside the room. Another policy for every MRI facility is to ensure that all staff and patients entering the MRI room are screened. Most facilities have a detailed screening form, and a good screening form can be found on the ACR's website. An MRI screening questionnaire must be completed for the patient before each exam. Non-emergent patients should be screened twice. This can be accomplished by the patient completing the screening form and then the MRI technologist reviewing the responses in detail with the patient prior to entering the scan room. Emergent patients are allowed to be screened once if that is all that can be accomplished, but the screening does need to be done by the MRI technologist. Be extra cautious with non-ambulatory patients. They are typically transported with MR conditional or MR unsafe wheelchairs or stretchers. There also may be hidden objects such as needles, oxygen tanks, or scissors under sheets and covers. When it is possible, transfer these patients to a detachable MR table in Zone 3. All MR personnel, such as MRI technologists, are to be screened upon employment and then immediately report any procedure or surgery or device implant. For staff such as ancillary nurses or doctors that are not always present in an MRI environment, we recommend you complete the MRI screening questionnaire annually and then ensure a physical screening for objects prior to entering the room. Pediatric patients represent unique risks. They often don't know or remember what possible devices or implants they may have on them. So ensure they are questioned at least once in the presence of their parents or guardians, and then once separately. Make sure to gown them before entering zone four, and remember that comfort items brought from home, such as pillows or stuffed animals, represent some real risks. Evaluating the patient or staff for ferromagnetic objects is just one part of the screening. There are several other elements of the screening, which includes looking for devices or implants that may be disrupted, assessing for metallic tattoos, and evaluating the patient for the risk of NSF, or nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. Remember, not just patients get screened. All staff and any individuals accompanying the patient need to be screened. If a patient has had an orbit trauma by a metallic foreign body, radiographs are recommended. Also note that a successful MRI exam after orbit trauma involving metallic objects is not considered sufficient proof of safety for subsequent MRI exams. A patient may have intracranial aneurysm clips and the MRI technologist will be required to determine if the patient may be scanned. If it is unclear if the patient has an implanted clip, plain film radiography may be conducted, or previous CT or MRI exams may be evaluated by a radiologist. The MRI exam should not be performed until the specific manufacturer, model, and type of clip is confirmed as conditional. The MRI exam may be conducted under conditions stated by the manufacturer. Note that a patient may have had a successful MRI exam previously with the clip implanted, but that is insufficient evidence to indicate that the current MRI exam will be safe. Further information on aneurysm clips may be obtained in the MRI safety manual by the ACR. When screening the patient, ensure you look at the clothing. Many new outfits have ferromagnetic or conductive materials in them, such as silver or copper. Reliance on the clothing labels is not sufficient as the quantity of the conductive materials may be small enough to not be listed. All street clothing or workout clothing must be removed due to the new fabrics incorporating metal. Many facilities are simply requesting that all patients disrobe and don an MRI safe gown or scrub. Dermal implants are a concern when screening. Conducted loops may be created by skin adornments such as tattoos, especially with dark colors of ink and curve patterns. Ensure you review examples of dermal implants with the patient and discuss the potential of problems with them.
A new recommendation in the 2019 MRI safety document is to conduct a full stop and final check. The 2020 ACR MRI safety guidance further specifies that this should be performed for all patients. The MRI technologist confirms the patient name and completion of the screening form. They also confirm that support equipment has been screened and may be allowed and any individuals that will be present with the patient are screened and given safety instructions. At this time, the MRI technologist also checks for any hidden foreign objects. This final check is completed before allowing the patient to enter the room. In recent years, there's been a big discussion about the effects of contrast agents. Gadolinium-based contrast agents could potentially cause nephrogenic systemic fibrosis for patients that suffer from renal insufficiency. It is a rare but serious systemic disease causing fibrosis of the skin and other tissues throughout the body. The cases of NSF are primarily with patients with acute or chronic renal failure and that have a GFR rate of less than 30. Ensure that at-risk patients are screened with lab results and follow your internal policies on any contrast administration. Let's discuss gadolinium-based contrast agents, or GBCAs, a little more. A great reference for guidance is the ACR Manual on Contrast Media, recently updated in 2023. Please refer to this manual for details, including some education on risks associated with gadolinium. The manual also includes a new statement concerning the risks associated with administering gadolinium during pregnancy. They recommend avoiding the routine administration of GBCAs to pregnant patients, but also recognize the low risks involved. Please refer to that document for more details. They have placed GBCAs into three different groups listed here. Group 1 are those that have been associated with the greatest number of NFS, NSF cases, and Group 2 are those agents that are associated with few, if any, cases of NSF. Group 3 are those agents in which there is limited data regarding NSF risk, but for which few, if any, cases of NSF have been reported. There is a new process for assessing the risk with NSF and contrast agents. I recommend you obtain the ACR's manual on contrast agents and review the new processes. In general, if you use group two agents, the risk is low and assessment of renal function with a questionnaire and lab testing is optional. For group one and three agents, there is a risk of NSF if the patient is on dialysis or has severe or end-stage chronic kidney disease or has acute kidney injury. When you are administering group one and three agents, you need to identify the at-risk patients prior to administration. There are different methods for identifying risks based on if you are imaging an inpatient or outpatient. For outpatient, simply asking if there's a problem with their kidneys is not sufficient. Utilize a set of questions that includes risk factors, and this set of questions can be found in the contrast manual. Once it is determined if the outpatient may be at risk, then complete some lab tests and calculation of EGFR. For inpatients, it is a little easier if you simply obtain the EGFR two days prior to the scan. Also, you would assess the patient for possibility of acute kidney injury as EGFR is sometimes not a good indicator. The ACR manual on contrast media gives some general recommendations for imaging patients at risk for NSF. Now that we have covered many items that are associated with the magnetic field, we will move to the hazards associated with the RF radiation in MRI. This radiation is not like the ionizing radiation associated with other imaging modalities such as CT or X-ray. This is non-ionizing radiation. This non-ionizing radiation does not cause harm to the atoms in the body, but does deposit increased energy. When this energy is deposited, our primary concern is heating. In MRI, we have many ways of describing this heating effect. One method is to use the specific absorption rate, or SAR. Almost all magnets will provide the SAR rate for the patient, and you need to select whether the patient can have a normal SAR, which is about two watts per kilogram over the whole body, or they can have the first level mode, which allows twice as much RF radiation. We typically like to scan patients that may be higher risk, such as pediatric and pregnant patients, under the normal mode. 
Another indicator of RF radiation on newer systems is the B1 plus RMS. This is a direct measure of the RF electromagnetic field and is associated with the magnetic field generated by the transmit coil. This indicator may be a better way to determine if there are any localized temperature increases for devices or implants. It is typically expressed in microtesla. Another indicator of RF radiation is the specific energy dose or the specific absorbed energy. Many new systems are using this indicator, which gives the total amount of energy absorbed by the patient. It is simply the specific absorption rate multiplied by the time. Most manufacturers limit this to 14,400 joules per kilogram. There are several ways to reduce the RF radiation exposure. First, consider adjusting your protocols to use lower flip angles, which will reduce the RF energy needed to achieve a signal. Use a longer TR and when possible, use transmit receive coils. These coils use less power as they are closer to the object being scanned. You can also cool the patient by ensuring the temperature in the MRI room is low and you have some airflow through the bore. Most patients when using the SED or SAE unit are able to cool themselves through patient perspiration or their own blood flow. Patient heating in general is a common concern, but in addition to general patient heating, we need to worry about specific burns caused by items left on the patient. Metal objects can cause burns on the patient's skin when the RF fields interact with them. All metal leads and patches should be removed prior to the patient entering the MRI room. There have been some recent events as well when burns occurred due to the patient's skin touching the inside of the MRI scanner. Padding should be used around the patient to prevent contact with the bore. Also, you should discourage the patient from forming loops with their arms, legs, or fingers in order to prevent conductive loops that can cause burns. So in general, to ensure thermal safety, remember to screen for all electrically conductive material, avoid any large conductive loops, including limbs, and care should be taken to place thermal insulation between the patient and any electrically conductive material. Do your best to keep the scan room cool and turn on the bore fan. You should always give the patient a squeeze ball and instructions to immediately report any burning sensations during the exam. Now we do our best to prevent any items from entering the MRI room that shouldn't, but many patients have implants or devices that may be present during the MRI exam. These are what we call MRI conditional devices or implants. Each device will have specific conditions in which it may be used within the MRI room during scanning. Ensure you research each specific item. A typical list of conditions is listed here. Note the conditional only indicates that the device or implant has been tested under those specific conditions and does not mean it is safe or unsafe at other conditions. Remember, each device or implant needs researched. This will take time. So plan in advance to have these items reviewed to ensure the patient can be scanned when they arrive. Seek the information from the product literature on the device. Search the manufacturer's website. A common reference is the list located on MRISafety.com and many sites subscribe to MagResource.com. Once you have all the conditional information, you will need to check each specific conditional item with your magnets specifications. A confusing item on these conditional statements is the spatial gradient. Let me take a few moments to explain this concept. The spatial gradient is the change in magnetic field over distance and is usually given in Tesla per meter or Gauss per centimeter. Since the magnetic field within the magnet is uniform, the spatial gradient inside the bore is usually low or no, near zero. The largest spatial gradient is typically outside the magnet at the bore entrance. You need to know where your maximum spatial gradient is located and the value associated with that spatial gradient so you can decide if the patient can be scanned. Each manufacturer will provide you with spatial gradient information. The data from Siemens systems is usually very difficult to interpret. In this case, we have taken the typical spatial gradient information from Siemens and presented it in a way that you can see. 
Notice that the maximum spatial gradient is on the bore surface, outside the magnet. When evaluating the ability to scan someone with an implant that has spatial gradient conditions, you need to decide if the patient will access the area with the highest spatial gradient. In this case, if you had a device that specified it could be in an environment that had less than 5 tesla per meter or 500 gauss per centimeter, you need to assess if the patient will actually be present just outside the bore at the bore surface. This diagram is another interpretation of the data from Siemens. The contour lines are those provided by Siemens, and we have superimposed those on a magnet to show you where these maximum spatial gradients are located. You can see that the maximum spatial gradient for this magnet is on the bore surface at about 11 tesla per meter. Here is a spatial gradient map for a 3T GE system. You can see the bore wall here with the large green line and the maximum spatial gradient of 1200 gauss per centimeter noted on the outside of the bore. But you should also note that the patient typically will travel between the two green lines noted here. So the patient will be traveling through spatial gradient areas of 320, 500, 630, 500 and then down to zero gradient as they move into the bore. So even though the manufacturer specifies that 1200 may be the maximum spatial gradient for this system, you need to assess whether the patient will exceed the maximum spatial gradients for their specific device of potentially up to 630 gauss per centimeter. The final mean hazard associated with the MRI systems is the pulsed gradient magnetic field. This is the load switching of gradients that occurs only during the exam. Our main concern with these noises is hearing loss, so we recommend that all individuals within the room have hearing protection. I'm going to address a few other items associated with MRI safety. Any MRI technologist is aware that many patients suffer from claustrophobia, anxiety, or emotional distress when they come in for an MRI exam. You need to have processes and procedures ready to address these real issues. These patients are difficult to scan. Take some time in trying to understand your patient's condition. Prepare and educate the patient. Sometimes facilities offer a pre-visit in which the patient can view the system to see what is going to take place during their exam. The position of the patient's head is important. Do all that you can to prevent the patient's head from entering the bore, so place their feet first. If you have the option for short bores or open magnets, see if those will work better for the patient. Soothing your patient through verbal, visual, and physical contact is important. Some new systems provide distractions for patients. Good lighting and air circulation helps as well. If you have done your best and the patient is still uncomfortable with the exam, you may consider sedation. Ensure that your facility has a sedation policy and follow it. When sedating, it is important to ensure proper positioning and padding as the patient may not be able to communicate with you if there's increased heating in an area on their body. Each facility needs to know what they will do for a code response. Your standard practice should be to remove the patient from the room prior to any resuscitation efforts. We recommend you practice this event with your code team so they know not to enter the MRI room. Once you've brought the patient out, you may need to guard or lock the MRI room door to prevent individuals from entering it. In case of a fire, ensure that you have procedures identified on how to extinguish it. Make sure that you have an MRI safe labeled fire extinguisher nearby. Every technologist needs to know about the concept of quenching the magnet. The magnet maintains its magnetic field through the use of cryogenics or very cold fluids. A quench occurs when you deactivate the magnetic field. This causes the cryogens to boil off rapidly. You should quench only under certain conditions, such as when someone is pinned against the magnet by a ferromagnetic object or there is an uncontrollable fire in the room which would require firefighters to enter. Each room has an emergency quench button. You should know where this is. Now we don't want you to simply quench the magnet when you have a minor concern as it is costly to get the magnet back up. If you do hit the button, cryogens will vent from the top of the magnet. These cryogens can cause freeze burns. If the gases do not vent, the room may overpressurize. 
There are typically backup vents to ensure doors can open. This cryogen vapor can cause asphyxiation, frostbite, or other injuries. So how do you quench? Well, it is quite simple. But again, please know the conditions required to activate a quench. You should know where your quench buttons are located. Push the button and evaluate the ability to move the person that was pinned against the magnet. Calmly evacuate the patient and all personnel from the area immediately. Sometimes scanners will quench on their own for unknown reasons. Safety systems are in place to adequately vent the gases. If the quench does occur spontaneously, remove the patient and make sure all staff are out of the MRI room. All sites should have a documented MRI safety program. There typically is an MRI medical director and MRSO or MRI safety officer that will be responsible for MRI safety. You should be aware of these safety individuals and know how to contact them. There have been many questions regarding pregnant MRI workers. There have been no documented adverse health effects for pregnant workers in the MRI environment. So an MRI technologist or physician may continue work as they typically do. There is a recommendation that workers not be within the scan room during the acquisition, primarily due to potential effects from the noise. If a patient is pregnant, the MRI exam may actually be the preferred exam. Many modalities provide radiation exposure to the patient and MRI avoids all that risk. At this point, no effects have been documented from MRI on the developing fetus. Therefore, no special consideration is recommended for any trimester. But as with all imaging modalities, it is important to conduct a risk-benefit analysis to determine if the study should be performed. Consider if the information requested from the MRI study can be obtained through other non-ionizing radiation modalities, such as ultrasound. Will the data obtained actually affect the care of the patient or fetus? Also, does the referring physician believe it is not prudent to wait until the patient is no longer pregnant to obtain the MRI study? Despite the ability to conduct an MRI scan on a pregnant patient, contrast agents should not be routinely provided. Again, conduct a risk-benefit evaluation to determine if contrast is really necessary. When scanning children, we have to consider the fact that they most likely will use sedation. As mentioned previously, ensure sedation is conducted according to the site policy and state requirements. For neonatal patients, ensure you monitor their body temperature. When you screen young children, you may need assistance from the parents to ensure no non-approved devices are present in the MRI room. To finish this presentation, I'm going to once again remind you that safety depends upon you. Make sure you are educated and vigilant. Screen everyone. You are the person that needs to take control of the MRI safety program. If you have questions, you may send them to me at this address. Thanks for taking time to watch this presentation.